Hello, hello. Welcome to the Eddie Conversation Podcast. My name is Eddie V. Hill, and I am your host. I am a filmmaker living in Los Angeles, California. Joining me today is actor Clayton Stalker Myers. Hi. I almost blanked and forgot your name for a second. Did you hear that? Did you hear that pause? Do you want to go again? No, it's great. Just take it. Okay. That's great. It's beautiful. Um, thanks for joining today. Thank you for having me. This is my my education in podcasting. Yes. Podcasting 101. Uh, okay, so I guess just for the sake of it, we're, 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 you know, this is, uh, again, the Eddie conversation. Yes. So this is a nice back and forth. I know you potentially prepped some also questions. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. We have topics around the yeah. space that yep, you can yep. ask questions about if need be. Um, we are here to, you know, learn about you and, uh, talk about stuff, share opinions and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> see how it goes. No pressure with a line like that. So question number one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> acting. I've heard of it. You heard of it and, uh, you've dabbled a little bit. Yeah. I want to talk about the, the the classic thing to talk about on a podcast is a, the journey of the individual. Um, and the thing that I'm interested in hearing about is how approaches to things change over time. Okay. Because you've been you've been at the craft for a while, for quite yeah. some time at this at this time. I don't know, ten plus ten plus years. Easily, is, yeah. Okay. So. Like, I'm always curious about, um, you know, where people live, what their approaches are. You've moved to L.A. in the recent uh, recent years. So I'm spoiling a lot of story, but that's only because, uh, yeah, we worked with each other. We know each other. And, uh, yeah, we've seen Ghostbusters together, Afterlife. And uh, you have a Ghostbusters hat on the side here. So let's start with who you are and, uh, yeah, what's your what's your... What's how do you introduce yourself to people these days? Uh, these days, I, I I don't even know. I haven't had much opportunity to introduce myself to people uh-huh. since moving here. Um, I got out here in late summer of 2019 and basically got settled into my apartment around September, and then started to like get the lay of the land just in time for the world to shut down. And uh, now we're gradually peeling our way back into something resembling what I was told is the LA quintessential lifestyle or something. So starting to get invitations to be social and be around people. So I'll, I'll have to come back to you as far as how I introduce myself when that comes. Okay. Noted, noted. How are you feeling? About, this is more of a topical thing here, but how are you feeling about the, uh, uh, here in LA, what, today is, um, today's a Wednesday. I heard, yeah. I heard, the mask mandates are being lifted around. I know California lifted it a few, like maybe like a week ago or so. LA yeah. County followed suit a little bit later. Um, how how are you living and how how does that feel for how? I mean, it it feels to me so far kind of like it was when everything started, just in the opposite direction, where it was kind of like discretionary to a degree. Like, I remember I was heading into work maybe about a week before everything shut down, and I would take the the red line into downtown, and I would see some people wearing masks, but also I I lived in New York City for a while, and that wasn't terribly uncommon. And so as we got closer and closer to, I think it was March 15th when everything stopped, but as we got closer to that, I noticed more and more masks, and it, it was notable enough to be questioning, is is something going on? And then, of course, everything became national news, and so I think we're kind of going the other direction. I was just at a coffee shop uh, before coming here, and I would say percentage-wise, people in line, it was probably 75% masked, and then 25% people being like, I'm good. And where was this? Where were you? Uh, this was Glendale. I mean, in a grocery store? No, a uh, coffee shop. Coffee shop. Okay. Yeah. I personally will probably continue wearing a mask forever. Well, <laughs> just 
I mean, it, it's funny. I, I feel like not even two years or a year and a half ago, people were just talking about how chances are there's going to be people wearing masks in grocery stores for maybe as long as we live who've lived through this. We shall see. I, I know for me, I've done like kind of what you were saying with uh, kind of gauging the landscape on how, wait, I like. I read like I read the headline that that the mask mandate was lifted, but then I go to the store and I'm like, wait, this seems the same. I'm not noticing a difference. But the mandate was lifted, but that doesn't necessarily mean that. <laughs> hey, I mean, we do a terrible job of actually conveying information. Yeah. I I I mean, how many times during the lockdown did we have to question like, wait, hold on, is this a mandatory stay at your home situation or because I. I went out to get groceries and people are just like hanging out and you're thinking, what, where are the rules? What, what are we doing? Where, how, how much distance are we supposed to have? You go to a a Trader Joe's and they're, they've got like literal dots to keep you specific amount of space away from each other. And then you go over to like, I I don't want to just name drop a place that maybe was not doing it safely, but like another grocery store and people are basically just cramming into the space and, it's just constant wish washing yeah. of rules. Oh, yeah, it definitely is interesting. The um, dispersion of information is that the right word? Like you have the CDC saying uh, either way, the sure. whole, the whole, the whole. Yeah, getting information out is difficult. And then I know, I know. Even when it is out, now I'm noticing that now it's kind of business to business, which is like I know I've been to some coffee shops where it's like we require masks for you to come into the space, yeah. and then other ones are like we recommend masks to come into the space and then some don't have science at all. And then I'm like, all right. All or, right. or even, um, I guess it's going to become less so now with the, the mask mandate lifting, but the requirement of, uh, proof of vaccination mm. where I, I feel like they're, I mean, they tried that at one point. They didn't really follow through with that. I, again, it depended on where you went. Uh, I mean, if I, if I'm eating in somewhere, whether they ask for it or not, I kind of, appreciate it when they do because i bothered to get it but um i'll purposely make it a point to show them my id and vaccination card because they're serving me i want them to feel safer by proxy like it's just i I feel you i feel you yeah yeah it's been weird okay (laughs) i don't know all right just cut all that no (laughs) no it's great we don't cut um so acting Yes. Let's talk about where, uh, maybe where you are now. Um, and then we can work maybe backwards to the beginning. Sure. Or, uh, yeah. Cause I don't know. Like, I'm always curious about people that do have experience in the industry and people that have been, th- you've, you've worked on many features. You've, you've, yeah. you've been in narrative spaces for, for a long time. Um, and, so your approach to tackling yet another hurdle in the in the in the in the grind is always interesting to me. Uh thank you. Uh I would say the approach really is kind of dependent on the project, dependent on the role, dependent on the timetable. I mean there's so many variables going into it. Um thankfully it, it it's always a learning process. There's always opportunity to to learn and discover new approaches. I feel like when I started doing this, um, I don't know what the, the common, not even common, but the, the old nomenclature is the whole like, Oh, I, I went in with a dream and a, a pocket of what coins or something. I don't know. Uh-huh, something, yeah. something silly like that. And there's some truth to that in the sense that I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I graduated high school. I knew this was what I wanted to pursue. I got a hostel for like a week, maybe two weeks in New York, circled all these audition notices and backstage, a a publication that lists these things and didn't go to a single audition, completely wussed out. Um, And realized I, I genuinely had no idea what I was doing. So when I came home, tail between my legs, despite having a nice time in New York. Where was home at this point? Uh, this was Frederick City, Maryland. Okay. Born and raised. And um, when I got home, I realized I needed to do a little more research. Headshots. 
those are kind of important in this line of work. A resume doesn't hurt, even if you don't really have anything beyond like high school theater and community theater. And um, I ended up selling my game system at the time. I think it was a PS2, I want to say. Grand Theft Auto 3 had just come out. I don't know. I have no idea. I was a big fan at the time, uh, but I also knew that I was spending more time playing Grand Theft Auto 3 than actually pursuing anything. So I sold the game system, used that money to buy my first headshots with a local photographer. Okay. And uh, they did me well. I, uh, I, I Headshots are almost exclusively color now. Uh, I was literally maybe one of the last people to get a black and white headshot because that was still considered preferred for theatrical really? headshots. Whoa. Back yeah. Then. Okay. Nice. Dating myself here. <laughs> okay. or, or I just was receiving yeah. poor information. <laughs> but sure. in any case, there I, I still like how the shot looked overall. Um Okay, so you sold the PlayStation, it seems like for two reasons. Was it, um, you needed money for the headshots? Yes. A. Yes. B, you also brought up the fact that you're playing it too much, so. Sure, if, you know, uh, if I wanted to do anything else with my life. <laughs> so you so was it, um, okay, because I mean, it, was, it, was, it was doubly beneficial. Yes. It's like, it takes the distraction away, and it moves you a step forward um, towards the dream. Okay, all right. Um, from there, it was primarily student films, independent shorts. Um, this was methodically a way to get more footage and more on-set experience quicker. And this was New York? Uh, this was still primarily Maryland. Okay. Um, though I did go up to New York from time to time. Um, so, the, sorry, go the, the go Maryland, D.C., Virginia area is relatively called the DMV amongst the people that oh. work there. Thank you so much. <laughs> in the industry. I have seen, I know on Instagram, people have it in their bio. It says DMV. Yeah. And I have been so confused Why for they're so at the long. Department of Motor Vehicles. I knew it wasn't the DMV DMV, yeah. the, but I had no idea what it was. D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Oh, and you can so kind much. of throw Philadelphia or Pennsylvania and parts of uh, Delaware in there as well. It's a weight lifted for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so you're around that area. How would you describe that film scene? Uh, yeah, what is that? What is how how? What opportunities lie? Because you mentioned like you, yeah. I mean, I I have nothing but gratitude for my time being able to be there and and working with a lot of fellow just aspirational creative people. Um, there are definitely projects that I'm. Should I hold for sound? I just... No, you're good. Okay. It's like this this dump truck is just a metaphor for it's like this going it's, down. It's guy. not picking it up. You'll see. You'll see later. Okay. <laughs> There's a dump truck. No. Um. <laughs> so, I mean, it was it was my education, for lack of um having an actual education. Yeah. I. In the same way of getting a black and white headshot for my first headshot, we had. We have casting directors in those areas, the DMV, um, but also because like DC, Maryland, Virginia, especially, a lot of the productions that are happening there, not exclusively, but a, a lot of the time are also industrials for people who might not know. Um, industrials are those things that you're always laughing about when you hear that you have to go watch like a video at your corporate job for yeah. HR things and... Um, you know, they'll pause in between a scene and be like, did Dave make the right decision? Or yeah. what should Dave say here um, to Sally, blah, blah, blah. And because, you know, D.C., we're, we're, we're talking corporations, we're talking government stuff. There's just all these kinds of industrials. There's also a lot of commercial work, specifically local commercial, but occasionally uh, international as well. And then once in a blue moon, you also get actual Hollywood shows come into town, DC again, especially House of Cards, Veep, um, the show Turn, which I believe was AMC, if I'm not mistaken, shot in Virginia. Um, and so these casting directors, you know, they're, they're doing really important work as far as the community goes and the industry. Um, and I was intimidated by that and thought, I need to get experience. I need to get uh, on these these student films and indie film sets to show that I, I can do anything and then realize that like the commercial market 
yes, it, it helps to be able to say lines. It helps to be able to put words together and sound convincing. Or get paid. Specifically, get paid. But I thought you needed, you know, not necessarily a, a, a degree from Juilliard, but I thought you'd be better suited to come into a casting director's office and be like, I'm not wasting your time. I've done a few things. And then realize, like, no, you've got an interesting look. You can say these lines and and put the words together cohesively. Come on in. Like, the door's open in the commercial market. And um, I didn't realize that until probably five or seven years in, where I was like, oh, I could be doing this and making money? Oh, man. Lessons learned. Lessons learned. It sounds very... I guess I always try to relate it to, like, because I moved here from Reno. Yes. And it feels, you know, just very similar. Yeah, a non, I consider that area, like we know, a non-film town is how I usually describe it. Okay. Because I know people have talked to me about, like, you know, their time in Boston or, or uh, if it's not New York or LA, it's usually, you know, something in the middle of, of uh, between non-film. It sounds like that area is a little bit more, has a little bit more going on than, like, potentially Reno did. But hmm. I do know... I do recall helping some industrial shoots, like as an AD and stuff, and watching uh, watching the cast. Because there was like one, like pretty much one acting studio in town and one casting person in town. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I'd have lots of friends that were going through the acting program and like doing classes week in and week out. So when they had the, finally an opportunity to be getting paid in front of a camera, it was just interesting seeing friends that were pushing for the narrative stuff having to having to act in the, sure uh, yeah yeah in in those more uh educational instructional videos it's, it's always like a weird wacky kind of thing it's yeah it definitely it's fun when people come up and they'll they'll ask you know do you do you prefer film or theater uh-huh and you're like i mean there's so many more spectrums on that that rainbow like there is industrials there are commercials there you know granted on camera is maybe the linchpin c- component towards film but like it's not exclusive there is improv performances versus scripted on stage and i mean ultimately the the joy is acting the joy is to be able to perform there are definitely um some sets that i've been on where i've scratched my head and thought what am i doing here mm-hmm. but sure. there are but at the same time there's this gratitude of like but i'm here this is great mm-hmm. i don't know what i'm doing but i'm here and and you have an opportunity to play yes so okay all right sorry so you you're five you're five to six years into uh that pursuit you're learning this lesson about how you could be doing this and this at the same time yes um so you're still in the DMV area primarily for Just three, bouncing three up and down the East Coast okay. for doing, the most doing, part. Okay. So what yeah, what's uh what's the next what's the next step? Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to I also know about um like through your website, for instance. Sure. You highlight a couple of um like awards that you got that yes. were like twenty ten, twenty thirteen. Yes. So I guess I'm trying to gauge leading up to kind of that phase of uh So from doing the independent shorts and features, um I'll I'll try to just hop and skip here. But sure. um I had done a short film called One Night in December with a director uh writer director named Andrew Sadler. And he inadvertently had had his fellow creatives that he was showing his film to. And one of them reached out to me for, I think it was a 48 hour film festival participated with that. Um, I didn't hear from him for a while. And then I don't know, maybe a year later, he just reached out to me out of the blue and just said, I'm writing a feature. I've got the first 30 pages. I'm thinking of you for this role. Would you be interested? So I'm reading the first 30 and I'm, I'm liking what I'm reading and he's just kind of piecemeal sending me like the first act, the second act, all the way to the end. Um, I'm definitely interested. This would be my first time in the lead role of a feature. Uh, we'd shoot it in Towson, Maryland, primarily. And then he specifies that he has someone uh, listed as a producer who I've worked with on several projects, who I consider a dear friend. Um, I'm just going to say their name, Stacy Jones Gensler. I, I 
I love name dropping. I I think it's that's no, great. It's great. Like I I don't know why people try to like hush hush about name dropping people, and I'm like because they're they're great. You wouldn't be talking about them if you didn't have something nice to yeah. say. So like. Give them their their credit. Give them their dues. It's nice to give a shout out to the friends that we yeah that help us along the way and that sure. are awesome and that yeah no for yeah so, yeah hundred percent. I mean, it's great. Ideally, down the road, I'll produce some of my own stuff, and she'll be one of the first people I call. Um, and basically, anytime somebody says, "Oh, I want to produce something," do you know anybody or do you have any recommendations? I'm like, Stacy, Stacy, Stacy for days. I actually had somebody text me out of the blue about a contract of some kind that I don't know anything about and I immediately just referred them to her all the way back in the the DMV so shout out to Stacy everybody so you found out that she was uh going to be producing and and that was kind of like that some... kind of locked it in for me yeah, where I was gave, like yeah this gave is... a lot of confidence to sure. yeah and so um I think we shot that in somewhere between 19 and 21 days we had an on-site editor, uh, so we had a rough cut pretty much by the time we wrapped. That's cool. Yeah. And um, I think it's gone through a couple of revisions since. I believe it's on Amazon Prime still, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we were accepted into the Action on Film Festival out here in California. And this was my first time out west. I, I got a plane mm. ticket, came out. Um, I pretty much just saw my hotel room and the theater and anywhere on that same drag in between the two for about a week that I was out here. I didn't really see much else. Okay. Um, yeah. cause that was what I came here to do, uh, was to go there and, and promote the film and meet other filmmakers and yeah, network. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, there are still a few people that I am in touch with. And unfortunately the director of that film festival recently passed away, but um, wow. His name was Del Weston. He was a sweetheart of a guy, just a, a big old teddy bear, loved action, loved filmmaking, was a, a huge champion of just, I mean, of me, I felt his support constantly. And I, I was actually messaging with him during the lockdown about, you know, when things get going again, we got to, we got to see each other face to face and maybe make some plans to work. And then unfortunately he, uh, he passed. So. But hopefully his film festival still lives on, the Action on Film Festival. Okay. Um, so uh, I was nominated for Best Lead Actor. My uh, co-lead, Whitney Nielsen, was also nominated. And um, I, I won, which was surprising and lovely and fun. And then um, about three years later, uh, another independent feature that I was in called The Maladjusted, also submitted to the Action on Film Festival. And I, if you had asked me what the role was, I would have said it was a comedic supporting character. And somehow I again won a, a lead actor award at the Action on Film Festival. So maybe that was Dell again watching over me, but. Yeah. No, okay. Well, congrats on the win. That's kind of cool. Thank you. Can you, I'm curious. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what to, all right. Um, <laughs> I want to ask a little bit of the nitty gritty logistical stuff on the production aspect of it as well, because I enjoy that aspect. Of sure. It. So when you are um, for this first one that you acted, and you said nineteen to twenty one days ish. Yes. The on site editor. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the story and uh, maybe like the the scope of that film in terms to give a little foundation on the maybe what that process was like and sure yeah uh i mean i can i can primarily only come at it from my experiences sure, sure. as being on set so um a general example of my experience like there was money but not like a ton of money my yeah. understanding from a production standpoint was that their objective was to primarily do handheld um over the shoulder shots mostly in kind of close up like we're really in this character's world this character's perception and i think one of the only shots that isn't that way is around the end when we start to pull back as the audience and let the story continue on its own um 
this was a personal story. The director, um, Justin, he, I, I, I feel like this is out there, but um, he based it on his sister who had been dealing with um, issues with Oxycontin addiction specifically. And so he wrote this story to kind of not tell her story, but tell a story inspired by his experience with her, um, her struggle with that and that addiction, which is still a huge thing going on in this country. Um, so it was, it felt relevant. It felt timely. Um, character wise, I, I saw it as a challenge to, to keep the character grounded as the, you know, your, your main source of perspective, but also keep it interesting Mm -hmm, of course a lot of times it's it's especially an independent film um and this is no slight to anyone but a lot of times especially in a dramatic film the lead can come across as very generic and basic when they're surrounded by colorful and character um characters with more eccentricities yeah i mean that that's always that's always the issue in uh even like in tv and stuff i know sure yeah yeah i think about how i met your mother for some reason with a ted mosby guy who's he's the, like the least memorable and you have barney that, stinson and sure you, yeah you have yeah everybody else is the people you actually want to watch and then you get stuck with with ted for a while and you're like all right ted just figure your stuff out mister so ob- objectively the goal was to to be that without necessarily falling into that trap, um, which I I guess I did okay for the sake of the action on film festival. I yeah. don't know if I don't know if Amazon reviews agree, but <laughs> <laughs> that's just the 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 beast that you have to deal with. So it was um, there were a lot of really interesting days. I mean, we had a nightclub that we had full access to at one mm-hmm. point, mm-hmm. but um, and I remember that night where there was like a torrential downpour. Um, but again, because we shot it so close, we didn't need to fill the whole dance floor. Love that. We were able to cheat a lot of it. And there was that kind of stuff that happened uh, throughout it. So we shot at a grocery store one night. Again, minimal extra is necessary because we're so close. We just need movement in the background. Um, we had a house party where at that time we actually had plenty of extras, go figure, because it was nearing the end and it was kind of, this will lead into our rap party. Yeah. Which I, I appreciated. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I That's was intense. I was sleeping on an air mattress in the director's basement through the duration. Love that. And and like even I guess that wasn't the rap party, but like when we were done with my coverage for the house party, I went to sleep on that air mattress. And there's just like I think there's photos of people watching a movie, maybe 10 feet away. Oh, wow. And I'm just passed out. You're dead. On my blanket. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's very resourceful. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess like I'm curious on the uh, the shooting it nice and up close is, is a nice is a nice way of uh, keeping things contained and keeping things producible. Yes. Um, Charlie yeah. Anderson was our DP. And this was the red camera back when it was still like, I mean, it, I, I know it's not especially light now, but... He had a legit back rig with the plastic piece coming up, and you had to yeah. latch it onto that, and then it was pulling it down. Yeah. And, I mean, he had that on his back and on his shoulder all 20, 21 days. That's, that's a lot of – that's a workout. Yeah. That'll, that'll break you down similarly – yeah, in a different way than uh, what you went through, for sure, a little bit more. I mean, I mean ob- objectively, we were we were right next to each other – the whole time. So there was definitely times where, I mean, non-union, I, I offered to like at least hold up some of the weight. You know, I wasn't <laughs> yeah. holding the camera. I was just alleviating some of the weight at times. Yeah, that's nice. Of so. you. Okay. So I, yeah. And then, um, okay. Nice. I was going to ask about like locations, but oh. you, know, you kind of talked about it a little bit. Yeah. I guess I was curious on... Um, how hoppy around it was or if it was mostly contained in in like his house and then you guys went out to the nightclub then the grocery store there were a few locations um there was some b-roll that we did for a montage where we went around various parts of baltimore and Mm -hmm. towson um my character's home was actually um that same 
director that connected me with Justin Andrew's house, Mm -hmm. which was a couple blocks away. Um, Yeah. Okay. Or maybe it was Charlie's house. I'm losing track. (laughs) It's been a bit. It's been a bit since then. A little bit. Okay. So (sighs) how does one process winning a lead actor award? Uh. I mean, going up and giving any kind of speech, I, I have no recollection. I just come down and people are like, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the second time, it was a, a similar circumstance where I, I just I just remembered to, to thank those. You know, you just, you think about the experience and you remember, um, obviously, the people who helped make it happen, which is the cast and crew, but then the people who helped make it happen for you in the sense of, um, for me, it was very quick to thank Stacy and Justin because they were the ones who came to me about it first. The fact that it was kind of written with me in mind is especially flattering. And then for the second one, um, The Maladjusted is a film that I turned down, I think, two or three times before actually agreeing to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was my best friend while he was on leave from a tour in Afghanistan. While we were sitting having coffee and he just said, do you have anything else lined up? No. It's like, does it pay? <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, then, I've had those conversations. And then there's an for award. Sure. I mean, um, there's actually a, an interview. It's on my website, but uh, uh, I did an interview with Dell. He had his own little like cable access show after the action on film festival. Mm-hmm. And um, he asked me a similar question as far as, you know, what happens when you have an award. And I I can only put this on myself, but I guess it all depends on the award. Like... No, well, you're the best if, actor. If, right. But I mean, you know, respectfully, I, I have... You were the best out of everybody that was in the nomination. I have reverence for the Action on Film Festival because of my experience with the Action on Film Festival. I have reverence for the Damn Short Film Festival Mm-hmm. because of my experience with that. But at the same time, respectfully, I had never necessarily heard of either until they were festivals that I was in and going to. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a difference between me rushing the door and being like, I have an award from these festivals versus I have an award from Sundance for, for this in these festivals. I mean, personally, I agree with you. It's not nothing, but also... Maybe again, maybe this is my own failure yeah. to try to to put these things on a higher pedestal, which they could be equally worthy of. But I'm already talking myself down I to be like, yeah. but it's not. You know, I'm gonna say action on film. Are you gonna know what I'm talking about? Because until I went, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, like I'm familiar with that fest because um, I I'm. It was a film festival that some Reno peeps had had been to before and, and, and such because it's kind of, I think it's not it's is it it's a, it's not Bay it's is it SAC is it where where is action on it was two different spots uh, between those two years so they may have changed location again yeah but yeah because I know I'm th- I guess I'm thinking about myself uh, as on, you should on uh, on if if an award was given to me sure. in that capacity and I I if I got my lead acting award for a feature film I'd be like. I kind of, I I talk it down too. Would be my initial instinct. It'd be like I I don't know. I like I just did what I was asked. I did the best that I could, yeah. and it wasn't me that like I yes I, I that's me acting. But really, I got to credit my scene partner for being so generous. I got to credit yes. the director for those amazing notes they get. You know, like all that kind of stuff. Where it's I mean it's I have mixed feelings about awards in this industry <laughs> at all. Um. <laughs> And I feel like that's a lot of people, and sure. but you're still happy to get one. You know, a compliment's a compliment. But the idea of, you know, you're you're comparing different cuisines. You're comparing like how do you how do you have two completely different stories told by um, completely different crews, probably with a completely different budget, like all of these components. And then discern, oh, well, this one's better. It's like, but you're comparing apples to steak. 
Like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both are good, and both deserve awards in their own right. I don't know. It's very, it's very confusing to me. Yeah, yeah. Best is, um, yeah. What's what's the word? Best is um, arbitrary. Something like that. Sure. That's a better word that I was looking for. There is probably a better word. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Subjective. Subjective. There you go. Yeah. Love that. Okay. Great. So awards, 2010, 2013, action on Film Fest. Yep. We are. Uh, Never won another. No. Uh, <laughs> we are now in 2022. Um, what has been uh i mean that's a lot of time to kind of go over here so i'm trying sure. to, i'm trying to figure out on what the uh maybe some highlights on like just even geographically speaking on um how you found your way out to LA. This is your first time living in Los Angeles or had you been here before? Uh and living you... this is my first time living here. Yeah. Okay. The question then is why did it take so long? That's a good one. Uh, the simple answer is fear and complacency. Mm. I Let's talk about the complacency first. So what? 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 Yeah. How? What? Jeez. Ask the question, Eddie. The question is, what were you up to pre-moving that was hard to kind of get away from? How, or I guess is the. Not only, I'm not trying to play therapist here. I'm just I'm more no. curious about the acting atmosphere in which uh, I guess I'm thinking about the actor perspective. Um, sure. Specifically. Um, geez, I'm trying to think of a way to unpack this that's <laughs> not too convoluted. Um, I this is a discovery I made in early 2019. So we're, we're going to skip ahead and then I'll be able to gloss over the the past, I think, a little more cohesively. Okay. In 2019, I had booked the lead role in an independent feature that was set to shoot in Austin, Texas. They flew me out in February. Um, Mid-February, we did a a table read, took some last-minute notes with the writers, um, and then some promo photos. Ultimately, they sent me back to Maryland, is the plan for three weeks. And then while well, they tighten things up, lock down more stuff, so on and so forth, fly me back out. We're going to film it. I didn't have anything specific happening in Maryland at the time. I say, tell you what, shoot me out west to California. Basically, same difference as far as travel and price. I can definitely crash on couches for three weeks and not stress too hard. So that's what we do. I figured maybe I could take some meetings, you know, like, hey, I'm uh, just in town before I go be the lead in a feature and sure, you know you can leverage that yeah didn't take any meetings but still uh <laughs> so i i catch up with friends and about a week and a half maybe just a week into being in la i get word production has been postponed indefinitely so i don't know what i'm supposed to do do i look for an apartment do i look for a flight back to maryland like the film's potentially not happening so glad i didn't take those meetings <laughs> sure, um, sure. you still would have been convincing with them sure, sure sure and you would have been telling the truth at the time at the time <laughs> and so um i started looking at apartments and wait so i'm just just to re-clarify so the plan was you're being uh they were like three weeks until we shoot and you're like just send me to la i can burn three weeks there yep and then you're here, and then two weeks before production starts, they say, uh, no go, um, bye. <laughs> and then, okay. More or right. less. So, so that's so really, okay. That's Yeah. That's, that's close. Um, and a bummer. But yeah. So I'm looking at apartments, not knowing what I'm doing. I'm getting all the, the basic questions. What neighborhood do you want to be in? I don't know. I don't know the neighborhoods. How much are you willing to pay? I don't know what's good. I don't know what's a fair price. What what should I be looking for? Um, you know, do you want parking? Uh, all all the amenities, all yeah, these things. I think it's tricky. Yeah, and I'm completely out of my element, and I'm realizing that my going into it initially is a roof, four walls, a bathroom, 
Like, what what am I supposed to ask for, Mm -hmm. right? And I kind of realized that that is that has been my status quo. That has been my programming from be it upbringing or whatever have you, nature versus nurture. The idea of growing up and and having primarily like, as far as my recollection goes, uh, meatloaf, tuna noodle casserole, um, grilled cheese sandwiches, things that are not terribly expensive to make can be reheated, leftovers, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not realizing like as as you're getting older like you just you accept oh this is what's for dinner i'm thankful to have food sure not know that you could expand your palate not know that you have these options to you know you hear somebody ask for oh i want a burger but i want it cooked this way i don't want this i do want that throw this on top and you're like why are they making this so complicated you just wanted a burger right it's a burger mm mm-hmm. mhm and so that, I think, is kind of where the, the complacency factor came in. The idea that I, I did move to New York. I lived there for a couple of years. I did a few projects that I, I'm happy that I was a part of. But there is a component of actors and myself at times where you're just happy to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then there is that other component of what do you want to be doing? What do you really want to be doing? And that's the question. You know, it's not, well, do you just want to have a burger or do you have a specific way you'd like this burger cooked? Do you want to just have four walls and a roof or do you actually have some preferences as to heating, air conditioning, so on and so forth? Yeah, part of town and all that. Yeah, noise and just there's lots of, yeah. And I, I, you know, for as much as this pursuit is a passion i i feel like for a long time i've kept it fairly tempered not wanting to to cause any waves or undue attention and i'm starting now i mean be it some of the self work that hopefully some of us did during the lockdown mm-hmm. um i'm working on finding that voice and trusting that i can be a little louder without being a nuisance that just because I speak up doesn't mean everyone's necessarily going to roll their eyes and cross their arms. And so, yeah, I would say that there was a a good period where I got comfortable and then got complacent. And I was still hustling. I was still working. I was still, you know, finding projects that I could get into and very passionate about. But um, basically... That project in Texas, the the filmmaker ultimately had a commercial come up. And by this point, we're in April. So I I had two jobs before I left. I, I was working at a restaurant and I was working at a, a theater as a stage tech. And I told both of them, I'm going to LA for three weeks and I'm going to film this feature and I'll be back probably early to Mm mid-March. I didn't get back to Maryland until May. And the director flew me back into Texas. We filmed this commercial. And then I went to a friend's wedding in Florida. And then I was back in Maryland. And weirdly enough, both jobs, basically the restaurant says, oh, hey, you're back. Um, Just pick up shifts. uh, and, And then we'll put you on the schedule. The theater. Oh, good. You're back. We've got a show this weekend. Just come in on Friday. Yeah. I mean, I'm thankful, but I'm, I'm also scratching my head. Like, how do I say, oh, I'll be back in three weeks, come back three months later, and people are like, here's everything you left behind. And then um, an industrial, going back to that, that I had filmed the year prior, 2018, the client was so happy with the industrial that they asked the production company, can we make more of these with the same cast so we have kind of a continuity in our industrials? So now I have a job lined up that between the the commercial in Texas and this industrial, I just spent three months in LA thanks to the kindness of good friends and their Mm -hmm. patience. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm able to pretty much make all that money back that I, I lost or, or, you know, was down from doing that trip. And so I, I took a long jog. I got home, realized my cardio was crap after <laughs> traveling for three months and trying uh-huh. to catch my breath while staring at the ceiling fan. I, I realized, okay, if I can step away from everything, come back oh. and have, you know, the, the two jobs – the financial security and acting work. If I can do that here, I can do that somewhere else too. So it's time to shake it up. And then it became that coin toss of New York and LA. But after having been out here, it, it felt like there was unfinished business. So I bought a used car from my buddy's dad. And about a month later, July, I was on the road. I didn't know where I was going to stay. I didn't know mm-hmm. what I was going to do. But um, even pandemic notwithstanding i'm grateful and thankful and feel like the journey is still there's still progression it's still moving forward yeah i'm sitting here talking with you yeah that's a nice thing here we are here we are i thought you were gonna go the the route and say that um the move to the move to los angeles in the end let's just say worst case scenario you could always go back and have these things still there i thought like interesting like we're like you, you said I'll be gone three weeks. You came back three months later, yeah, and everything was handed right back to you, and you're grateful and confused. And so, like the lesson, I thought you were gonna say the lesson learned was, this will still be here even if I make a like if it if I take yeah. a risk, I can still come back and things will probably be okay. That's interesting. I, I could see. I mean that that maybe that is a component to it. I think the other aspect or the thing that I tried to latch on to more was um even if you don't know how it's going to work out, it can still work out. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, I'm I'm again super grateful that those jobs uh took me back for the month and a half that I stayed <laughs> yeah. afterwards, but I I think and this is true again. It, it all just kind of snowballed from there. Like, I, I have a friend um, who's going to be on a show on HBO Max called Winning Time coming out soon. Just name dropping still. Great. Um, his name's Spencer Garrett. You should look him up and, and give him all the love. But um, basically, I I gave him a shout out just to let him know that I was, I was going to be coming back into town. And, you know, he was... Uh, accommodating right out the gate uh, as far as like, well, just let me know when you get here. It's like, well, thanks. Didn't expect any of that. And then um, the on-site editor of Heaven Burns, the mm-hmm. the film we were talking about, yeah. he lives or was living out here. He moved since the pandemic, but was living out here in Alhambra. And he says, hey, I've got a room if you want to rent it for a little while. All of a sudden I have that taken care of for a month. Like it just – these things that I never could have predicted, never could have fathomed, were the things that I avoided because I couldn't see them. Yeah. These risks, these these opportunities. I didn't I'd never driven across the country, so it was hard to visualize what that journey would be. I'd never lived out here, so it was hard to visualize how that was supposed to go. I was used to having my burger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, not yeah. realizing that you're, you're great with metaphors. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. Um, yeah, I mean, it's scary mixing it up and changing and going into, into the unknown. That's. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, we we love plans and we love um, familiarity. Yeah. Yeah, I I always find myself wanting to stay mindful between content content is good content is uh, a sense of stability versus complacent and i i could be wrong but i feel like a lot of times there's a very thin line between the two and i probably think about it a little too hard sometimes but Mm -hmm. that's just uh where i'm at love it i'm gonna bring up my notes here and we're going to pivot a little bit. Pivot. 
I could pivot. I could just keep looking around here and <laughs> appreciate <laughs> that you can't see it. It's off camera, but there's a Lincoln Park. Is this a record? It's a uh, it's a uh, vinyl. Yeah, vinyl. Lincoln Park vinyl. We got a Lincoln Park T-shirt. I'm yeah, gonna LP. go out for a shot and suspect maybe you're a fan. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Lincoln Park. It's nice. true. I've never been. Jeez, how dare you? But uh... how dare you? <laughs> no, yeah, I there. I don't know how you are with um, if you go to concerts often or if you've been, if you've dabbled in uh, how you are with music, but have you been to any big, big uh, live not, shows? Not crazy big. I volunteered at uh, Virgin Mobile Fest one year. Got some really cool shoes out of it. But, uh, nice. And, and in turn ended up seeing a couple different bands more or less by proxy, like walking around. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I don't like actively seek them out. I think the only, the most memorable one of recent for me, and it's still many years ago now, was probably Andrew Bird at the 930 Club in DC. Okay. Yeah. So the ones that you just kind of like experienced via proxy, like you say. Yes. Were they good? Uh, did you enjoy like were they bands that you were familiar wa- familiar of or did they did you get to or did hearing them turn you into a fan be like oh my gosh I did not plan on hearing this these guys are awesome or she's great not so much <laughs> okay. no like don't don't get me wrong I, and and it wasn't like I really stood there and and took in the actual show so much it was more like turning the dial on your radio and just catching it was just music glimmers yeah you didn't appreciate I, the art i co- <laughs> i didn't have I'm much just... time to i was still working i'm just but i i did catch during a, a chili pepper set they stopped playing because basically i guess somebody was ODing okay in yeah. the crowd and you know those guys are all sober now and they were just like hey guys we love that you're enjoying the music we hope that you're having a great time but like please we gotta keep it you know be cool guys yeah yeah be cool and please help this person yeah, right now please but... make space stop trying to rush the stage there's somebody maybe dying here yeah yeah okay and copy <laughs> <laughs> no because now I, I think about um i saw lincoln park like five times in concert okay and uh they would they would win multiple awards like best live um uh, sure. show multiple years like are they're always like but class, then we're back to class. awards with art like well, i'm just saying yeah that other people like them um i'm not saying they should i no, i all i'm saying it's a world-class act and i loved every every show that i went to and it was beautiful awesome whoo good times good times i mean i i do know lincoln park <laughs> everybody yeah you should you should you should go and invest more time. I'm just kidding. All right. I'll just take this LP here. <laughs> and play it on your vinyl player, your record player. All right. I wanted to ask, you talked about um, burgers yes. as a metaphor for kind of preferences. Sure. And what you want. I know based, I'm just going off of your website here. Oh, boy. But you do talk about a niche for yourself that you have uh potentially recently discovered or i'm not sure how long you've been it's been a little while pushing for this but the description of this niche you say is uh playing as an actor playing tricksters yes with uh with devout love yes do you want to elaborate on that and how you came to that no no uh sure <laughs> <laughs> um so living in new york um there are a whole bunch of these I don't know if you want to call them classes or seminars or whatever have Workshop. you, but basic workshops, it's a good one. We're basically, um, as an actor it, without representation, agents, managers, what have you, um, your objective is to try to see casting directors, people that are, are in charge of filling the roles on say televisions and films that you would like to be a part of without an ingress you're basically just standing waiting to be discovered, which is probably not a great approach. Um, and so there are these companies that will oh, okay. I know where you're going. figure out how uh, to coordinate with casting directors or those agents and managers that you want to notice you so the casting directors will notice you, so on and so forth. 
and off ask you to pay them money so you can sit in front of them, have them tell you what they do, and then and then tell you who you are. Some of them will do that. Some of them will literally just let you do a monologue and be like, "Oh, maybe we'll keep you in mind or whatever." Okay, I but, thought okay, but there's there's a typecasting component. You yeah. know, you're gonna play the the tall, handsome, leading man. You're gonna play the uh, quirky best friend, so on and so forth. Those are all typecasting situations. You're the bubbly blonde. You're the um, meek office worker. Yeah. So. It gets more specific than that, but basically you go to enough of those and a, a friend of mine reached out and said, I went to this guy and it's a great start. To sure. Her. It's a great, great start. I went to this guy. Um, there, there's, there's a Zoltar machine at the pier and uh, if you, <laughs> so basically this guy's deal, as I understood it, is he asks you a bunch of questions Um. And your answers aren't the only thing he calculates. It's how you answer. It's he'll he'll go, you know, the baseline question and then like yes. five questions more based on your answer. Um, I think he said he, he can do it in, I want to say like 22 questions or maybe he started at 22. Now he can do it at like 11 or something. But the gist is, and and... For me, I, at this point, had already played plenty of different characters, plenty of different genres, plenty of different tones. At this point, he was figuring out where I resonate strongest. So Trickster, apparently, is something that I resonate with, that I I connect to. And on the website, there's a link where you can see a few basic Hollywood examples of roles that... I'm not saying I should have been cast as. I'm just saying if they were to cast it today, I'd, I'd probably be pretty good in that part. Um, so a trickster one is, say, Ocean's Eleven. I'm not saying I'm Clooney. I'm just saying Danny Ocean, the character, is a con man doing an elaborate heist. And so there's the trickster component, but then the devout love at the end of the film he's ultimately trying to win back his ex-wife, you know, win back her love and affection and, and devotion. Um, doesn't need to be romantic. Uh, another example I have in there is the brothers bloom. And in that film, Mark Ruffalo's character is constantly creating elaborate cons. And ultimately the reason for that is because he's attempting to, to create a narrative for his brother to be able to come into his own as a person and connect with other people in a way that he just can't on his own. Um, And another one would be Will Smith in Seven Pounds. It's a good one. Where, not to spoil, if you haven't seen it, please just go watch that now. But um, he spends the film, you know, posing as an insurance adjuster and then by the end of it, you realize that this whole thing has been an elaborate attempt for him to cherry pick who he wants his organs to go to when he dies, in which he kills himself. But like, there is a there is a trickster component to that. And the devout love is, of course, to those who he's donating those organs to. <clears throat> so this um, specific character archetype, we'll yes. say... Uh, did this came about through the twenty two question deal that so you went through talking to this guy. Yep. And at the end of it, he said, "I think this is this is your A game right here." Is that how it came about? So the whole time we're talking, he's scribbling in this notepad. I'm not going to say I, I don't even remember if I got to see the actual scribbles, but like it was lists, it was random word diagrams, it was all over the place. Sure. Yeah. Um, the show. Yeah, and and I guess thematically or tonally, my answers had these common threads. Somewhere, somehow, the the words that I was using to describe things, um, the feelings that I was conveying, depending on what we were talking about, the commonality ended up being either this trickster component mm-hmm. or this 
fierce loyalty love component. And so near as I understand it, I don't have to be Will Smith in, in Seven Pounds. I don't have to be George Clooney in Ocean's Eleven. The fact that these themes exist in these stories imply that if I'm a part of these, if I'm just even prox- in proximity, and it doesn't have to be both. If I'm in a proximity of a devout love, a romantic comedy or something, if I'm the best friend to Owen Wilson or uh, McConaughey back in the day, I'm going to be... I'm somehow going to be vibrating on a frequency that people are like, you know, that McConaughey movie was pretty good, but that that one guy who played his best friend, he was really good. Like, I really gravitated to him. Mm -hmm. My attention did. Or just a thief film that has no concern about a devout love component. It's just a heist. It's like, I could thrive on that. But if it's both, again, Ocean's Eleven, if I'm just playing, I don't know, Casey Affleck's character, I'm somehow supposedly going to vibrate at a higher frequency in that character in that story yeah than something without either it's not to say that i can't act in other things it's just that that's sure. apparently where i'm supposedly gonna shine brightest yes okay so my follow my next question here yes is regarding uh you say supposedly where you'd shine brightest now no, I'm just okay. No, Not a doctor. <laughs> now there's two. There's two different. Okay. <clears throat> there is. Let's go again. Like nature versus nurture. This this is not that. This is some. This is you. Your design as a human being and the, your experiences in life kind of put you in a position where you vibrate in these frequencies that put you. That you, this would be where you would fit, where you could shine brightly. Now that's one. That's one lane. The other lane is you have the internal wants to potentially, like it, just because you, you'd be awesome in those. I'm also curious on if it aligns with what you want to do. I mean, thankfully, because it... if it's like, all right, I answered your twenty-two questions, and you're saying I can be a trickster and with the with devout love and like I agree that I can do that great but what I actually want to be is like I want to play sure. this other role and they're like well that's not really who you are. like I don't know how that I don't know how that works well thankfully to the best of my knowledge the person who did the questions isn't a casting director so yeah. uh he's not I, I don't believe he would be in a position to to turn me down for a role that I want yeah. um but objectively like I'm just wondering if it aligns with that's the direction that you actually want to go or if that's just the direction that makes sense because uh, you can do it. I will say that I, I am drawn to especially heist films and things like that. Um, I do enjoy the Ocean's Eleven films and um, Brothers Bloom is one that I, I really enjoy a lot. <clears throat> but the benefit is is that I, I don't feel that I have to only do those roles. Right. Um, but if the right script comes across and it, it, it does capture those themes, like if I do read a script and I, I, I will occasionally kind of try to keep an eye out for where yeah. those themes can exist, even if they aren't necessarily inherently up front in the script, like there can still be a component of that within my character, depending on how I play it. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel hamstrung by the fact that this is something that I'm aware of. I feel, again, I I feel fortunate enough that I know this. I don't feel the inclination to dismiss it outright. Um, this could be a charlatan. This could be a Zoltar machine basically just telling me, sure, here's your, here's your fortune cookie. And you're like, I'll run with that. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. 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 But, um, I'm willing to explore it. I, I do think that there is opportunity um, to shine in those characters. And, and um, frankly, as an actor, I'm, I'm drawn towards story. I'm drawn towards story told well. If it's a, a trickster with doubt, devout love, all the better for me, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if it's not and it's still a story told well, yeah, I'm happy to be a part of it. No, most definitely. You know, yeah, because I know, I know. I guess just just for those that have never acted before, sure, acting is difficult. It Get, can be getting cast is a process and difficult. Yes. So if there's anything that one can do to put yourself in a better position to 
be in more of the scope of being seen in a certain way, it's good to be aware of that so you can sure. put yourself out in the world and be seen as like, oh, for some reason, uh, I see Clayton as this one character, and it's probably because that's how he presents himself, and that's that's what you're actively pushing, so it yeah. kind of helps people I mean, to see the thing. Not... I, th- I think there's the component of, I don't know, like, you tell me, as a writer-filmmaker, <laughs> you're, you're not writing and making a film that you wouldn't want to see, right? Correct. Right. So, like, if somebody is only reading Robert Ludlum or Michael Crichton or uh, – I'm terrible at this. I'm spacing whoever writes – or uh, Tom Clancy, like these spy thriller kind of things. Like, they're not going to most likely say, you know what? I think I want to write a book. I really think it's got to be something like Eat, Pray, Love. Mm-hmm. They're probably going to write something that feels more – akin to what they gravitate to. So while I enjoy a lot of other different genres and films, I, I undeniably do gravitate towards, again, the, the Ocean's Eleven and so on and so forth. So the, those, are, those are fun movies. Yeah, those they're are fun. They're, they're, but if, if an opportunity presents itself, uh, I, would, I would probably be all the more likely to pursue it in that sense. Yeah. Great. It's funny because I honestly, leading into this probably <laughs> 20 minutes ago now, I honestly thought you'd be like, what, how do you prefer your burger? <laughs> how do you prefer where, it? Where is your favorite burger from? No, no, no. No. We don't, uh, no. This isn't a food podcast? Not yet. I've been waiting, I'm trying Not to get yet. there. What? I'm gonna being, eat okay. so good. So being that you have, I don't know. Have you've you've been in LA long enough? We'll just say, to, but not really. To no. potentially, okay, that's a part of. All right, how have you had the uh, the instance in which anybody in town has wanted to connect with you that is from out of town, where it's like, hey, I'm a friend from Maryland or New York, and I'm coming to LA. Do you want to hang? And then, you know, I. So, so the reason I threw out the interjection was just, yes, I've, I've technically been out here coming on three years, but really for the, the idea that somebody would reach out and do that, maybe a year. Yeah. As far as that being a possibility. So I guess, I guess what I was going to, what I was going to follow up with was there's a common question of like, well, like, where should we go eat or what, like, what's, what's good in this? Like, take, like, take me somewhere. Like, what restaurants do you love eating at? I'm still that guy. I'm still asking people for suggestions. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know a few spots near me that I've been to that I enjoy and have <laughs> kind of become my go-tos. But, like, outside of that, I got nothing. Because, I mean, that's how I feel as well. Yeah? You, you're you on three years, too? Yeah. Wait, how much earlier did you get out here? I was here November 2018. Okay. Okay. So, I've only got you by a few months yeah, or a couple so. Months. so. Um. But I don't know. I just, I just, uh, more my thing is I don't go out. Well, and again, for <laughs> two of these three years, that wasn't like really an option. You, you can't go out. Yeah. Okay. So we can't talk about burger places that we like because we don't know. I mean, I could tell you some burrito spots that I'm a fan of, or at least one in particular. <laughs> Sorry. You've been to one burrito place. No, no. That I, that I especially <laughs> would recommend. Yeah. Okay, do you want to shout it out? Uh, Fred 62 in Los Feliz. <laughs> I've never been. Really? Oh, Fred dude. 62. Got a nice burrito. There's a place near me uh, here in Burbank called Alfredo's Mexican okay. Restaurant. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it's, it's, pretty good. it's pretty good. I don't, I'm easy with uh, with burritos, man. You you hand over a bur- uh, I mean, you you got to really you got to want to screw it up. It's hard to yeah. Yeah. It's, you got to go yeah. I was gonna, yep. I was gonna try to make a joke, but oh no, go for it, please. No, no, set it up. How do you mess up a burrito? I don't know. <laughs> How do qu- you mess up a burrito? The, that's not the joke. Oh no, that wasn't the setup. <laughs> no. Hold on, knock knock. <laughs> How do you mess up a burrito? I was just thinking about how I went to a place recently um, for tacos, and I was I didn't. It's hard to mess up tacos. Okay, like traditional corn tortilla, small taco style. You got the that's the traditional. Like if you go to like a food truck, I don't know, like 
Those can be really good. They can be greasy. They can be meaty. They can be very simple. You have the uh, the onion on there, and you've got the uh, the green stuff. What's it called? Lettuce. Yes. No, the other green stuff that people don't like. Um, Walk. Jeez, it's leafy. Um, Cilantro. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, corn corn tortilla. Just gonna keep guessing green stuff. Shrek. Corn tortilla, some meat, onion, and cilantro. That's sure. kind of the thing. Nice and greasy. Hard to mess mess up. This place. Uh, the reason I didn't like it is because I am a meat eater, and it was a vegan spot. So okay. They, so they had the, the stand-ins where you can order. Um, so the place was already at a disadvantage. Correct. They weren't going to win. But they labeled it as if it were meat. Of course. So it's like this is the meat equivalent to if you wanted a uh, carne asada, order carne asada, and it comes, and it's sure. the vegan version of that. Not it's so not, much. It's not as good. Not as good. I agree with you. Tacos are hard to screw up, but I also got to say, and and this is probably a, just a personal preference. Tacos are tacos, so like because they're so what? hard to screw up, you gotta. I mean, like a if, bit if basic, you're gonna recommend a, a taco spot to me, it's got to be a banger taco spot. Where it's got to be like extra greasy hot, no just i don't know some something's got to be different i don't know if it's got to be the hot sauce or something but it's like yeah, it's got to be the taco where you're like what what has everybody else been doing this whole time that's, these that's people too- invented taco like so you need it to be a great taco for you to want to or or yeah for, i mean for, like with a burrito get you're getting you're getting a meal in a tortilla with a taco you, you're you're ordering like three to Eight at a time to get yeah. satiated. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I agree. What? Do you, how do you feel about crunchy versus soft? <laughs> yeah. See, now we're into it. Now <laughs> we are a food podcast. Um, I grew up on crunchy tacos. So I mean, like the the public school system gave you crunchy tacos. Okay. Like that's that's probably my introduction to it all. So I have indifference because cafeteria food. I don't know. You haven't. You're indifferent. So if. If, I think I would prefer a soft. Let's just say I was like, okay, after this podcast, I want to show you. I want to take you to this taco spot. They just don't great, waste my time. They, it they, better be banger. Better be they banger have the tacos. Best, they have the best tacos. They're bangers. They're bangers. And so you're 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 creating. I don't tell you anything about it. And I create this vision. Okay. I well, I just I did. Don't I, tell you anything, but I, I create this. <laughs> I don't tell you anything specifically, but sure. I, I tell you how great it is. Yeah. And it tastes great. And oh my gosh. And blah blah blah. But yeah. I don't describe it. Okay. Are you envisioning a soft taco or a crunchy taco? I think I'm envisioning a soft. I don't know. I I think for me, the soft taco, much like the burrito, I have the better likelihood that the contents are going to stay where I need it to eat it and i feel like with a crunchy i take the bite and then like a third of it just spills out because most of the shell is in my mouth Mm -hmm. okay yeah so a banger taco more okay i was just curious i want the all right that was the food segment everybody you're welcome you're welcome go check out that place that he mentioned when you're here in that other place he mentioned uh uh-uh. let's see I'll, add, I'll i'll stick with a little bit more of a um this is i'm gonna keep it broad i'm just gonna ask your opinion on this thing can i ask you your niche first for what what do you think your niche is as a director i mean as this as the kind of stories that you gravitate to like if you had to pick two descriptors or for me as an actor um, I, I mean, I, well, that's the thing. Like the niche thing wasn't exclusively towards my acting. Like yeah, it was... you could, you could go get it done with this guy and he's not going to say, go be an actor and do these roles. He's going to say, these are the stories or these, this is the narrative, be it your personal life, uh, your professional life, wherever you go, whatever you do, these are the things that really kind of are part of your core essence. Mm-hmm. And that's what translates. So like. I don't know. I mean, based on the stuff that you gravitate towards and the stories that you like to tell, what do you think you would describe your own? It's hard to niche yourself. No, but... I mean, that, I mean that's the objective as well. Like uh, when I'm a writer, when I'm directing, I have to find my own voice in that way as well. Sure. Where you watch it and you're like, oh, that's an, that's an Eddie flick. 
versus uh that's a you know every you know like a um uh, like a Michael Bay for instance or a I've heard of him that you know you kind of you know what to expect when you're going into certain sure. like a Jordan Peele or it's gonna if you're going to Jordan Peele flick it's gonna it's gonna be unsettling it's gonna be dark it's gonna be it's like horror elements in there and you're gonna get it's he's gonna he's he's gonna test some stuff out it's gonna be a little bit yeah. different for me I like to think about the um. It's also a little bit out of necessity based on the budget levels that I that I've been working on, but it's how I write too. But, yeah. but the the like the down to earth um, relationship, awkward, uh, heartfelt, sneaky, sneaky and messaging stuff. So I, I know I like the awkward moments. I like the quiet. I like the 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 subtle humor that comes in. It's not like a slapstick or a broad comedy. Sure, it's more of a. Um, Almost like, I don't know, I, I usually point towards like The Office or whatever where it's, it's funny, but it's just uncomfortable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, just trying to show those little those little quirky moments in day-to-day life that a lot of us try to hide from ourselves. Like we try to, we as people often want to put up a front that we have our stuff together and that, okay. we, that we know what we're doing. But I want to pull that veil back and show for how we really are. Um, so yeah, awkward, awkward, little unsettling, uh, quirky comedy with, uh, and then I want to sneak in the, um, the gut punch of actually it being about something, you know, mm. where you, you, you sneak in with the humor and then by the end of it, you're realizing, oh my gosh, my life, <laughs> I learned something today. Go watch that movie. Yes. It's on Amazon, right? It's what's on the inside? Yeah. Yes. All right. Which you were in. I, I do make an appearance. You yeah. do make an appearance. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that movie, I know, I don't remember you talking about this much, but I know when I set out to make that one, that one, I wanted to do, I wanted to do a rom-com, which, I mean, you can tell by, like, one of the initial posters. Yeah. Um, I love that poster design. And then it, it, it ended up being just a straight-up drama. It's, yes. It's a straight-up drama, and it's fine. <laughs> I just know. Well, I mean, I took the I took the lessons learned for sure, and I'm like, okay, I know where more time could have gone to kind of put it in the direction of initial sure. the initial vision. But yeah, I feel like the drama drama almost kind of comes nice and easy to me. So it takes a little bit more effort to throw the humor in and to send things in different ways. Like that's the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially in independent film. I don't. I mean. No, I'm speaking out of school. Let's change topic. <laughs> e. What was my question? Oh, you, I was going to have a question that you... All right. So this is... Um, there's this trend as of late. And I wonder if you're on the bandwagon or if you're... Uh, I mean, there's three... I mean, yeah. I'll throw out a word. It's it's a, a manifest. Manifesting manifestation okay those are different um variations of the thought to how do you feel about uh manifesting do you believe in manifestation how do you how do you view uh ma- i'm just gonna keep saying manifest yeah uh, i i didn't see manifest but i heard netflix is gonna pick it up so hopefully i don't know it gets new life there that's not what you're talking about. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I know. Um. <laughs> like, go on. Because um, there's a... I feel like I've been hearing it more and more often. Um, and oftentimes from actors. What are your thoughts on it? I'm asking you first. Okay. Well, it's just interesting to me that you're hearing it more and more often, which almost... I mean, I... Yeah. One, one could beg the question of whether or not you're wanting to manifest perhaps because you know that idea of like knowing that you want a a fancy new red car and then all of a sudden you just notice more red cars wherever you go like perhaps you're manifesting getting into that um i okay i feel like this might be dickish to bring up here Uh uh-oh i was gonna have this as a teaching moment on begs a question as a side note okay that um that's not how that term is actually used. Okay. 
And I learned this through a writing podcast in the last few years. Wait. So you would say raises the question, uh, okay. begging the question. Oh, I said means, begging the question, right? Yeah. You said okay. this begs the question. Okay. Where, so I know a lot of people in the world say it, so I'm doing it for you as well. Sure, sure. Raises the question is better. Okay. So I kind of, whenever I hear it, I'm like, ding, oh no, they're not using it right, I need to save them. That's no, I I appreciate the note. That's um, <laughs> as an actor, I take direction. No, um, okay. So sorry, you were asking. I <laughs> I got distracted by begs the question. I was asking if you thought that I I thought you were implying that I was using the word manifest wrong by making the comparison of people who say oh, they want a red no, car, no, no. right? And and you see a bunch of red cars. It's just interesting that I, this word is. I like. You're here's, noticing. Here's, it here's more. what I like. I like the idea of manifesting. Okay. The idea is you want something. Mm -hmm. And at least it gets a person to do that homework of figuring out what they want in life and where they want to land. Like, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to, like, I want to be working for Marvel at some point. I want to direct a Marvel sure. Disney Plus show. So at least homework is done and I know a destination that I want to head toward. Yes. Or as an actor, I want to co-star in a thing or I want to land a, a, yeah, whatever. Okay. So I like that the homework needs to be done in order to manifest. Like you need to create goals. You need to create wants. The thing that annoys me with the idea of manifesting, like I'll just say like, I feel like it's a TikTok thing. I don't know if that's true. I'm just speaking out of the turn here, but um, I've heard of TikTok. Yes, TikTok is a thing. The idea is you wake up in the morning and you say your mantras and you just kind of say things out into the world. And that alone will get you the thing. Like you'll manifest through like a vision board mm -hmm. and saying stuff. And as long as you just keep on that, um, you'll you'll manifest you'll manifest getting a dog you'll manifest getting a boyfriend you'll manifest as long as uh there's like certain ritualistic tendencies that come along with it okay it's how i interpret it and i which i think so my, my more of my thing is i like the idea of you have a goal and having the goal helps with the day-to-day -day opportunity the opportunity opportunities that come up in the day-to-day -day, you can process on does this get me a step closer to my goal and you can talk to people and you can work with people that in a way will help lead you in that direction and you can also nix things off that don't go that way so when you're like I got offered a role to be in this and it's a kid show with like, it's like, it's not really the direction I want to be going. I don't want to be making whatever. Like that's not, that's not where I want to be. So I can actively not put my energy there. I don't want to be a PA or I don't want to. Sure. So as long as you know where you're going, it'll help on the day to day, slow step, baby step toward that goal. Yes. But the actual aspect of, um, um, I don't know. Manifesting is weird. <clears throat> Does it? So, okay. So you're saying the the prep work of getting clear on what you want, you're behind. I love that. The idea of how to get there. creating practices to program yourself to concentrate your energy towards those things is where you feel is a little too I think, extra. I think there's... I think there's not enough emphasis put on the work that needs to be done to get there yeah like i feel like there's a um it's kind of like anything else like when when people want to get in shape or people want to lose weight or people want to uh you know reach a goal there people always want the easy way out and it's, it's got like my gym membership right here <laughs> don't know how to get to my gym but i've had this membership for a year oh Look, no i don't have a gym membership it's oh not. but yeah i get what you're saying i yeah. i don't know that i I mean, maybe it's just the people I'm talking with, but I don't know people offhand who um, specifically have the goals without the, in maybe, I, I mean, maybe I'm just intentionally trying to not be around the people that are like, oh, I, I made a vision board. It's I, uh, over, over somewhere. I've, um, uh, I've yeah. heard people 
literally say in conversation that I'm overhearing <laughs> or that I'm around like on set or anything. It's like, oh, like I want to like, oh, I, just, I would love to have a dog. Like, they're like you manifest that. And I'm like, well, why, why is that your advice? Yeah. <laughs> or I mean, you can just go and buy a dog. Or you could just go and buy a dog. Why do you have to man? I don't, I don't get the usage. I, yes, I, I think in that. I might need education. I think in that sense, it's a bit of a misuse. Um, I'm by no means proficient in all this stuff, but I will say that I like, I've learned to like what vision boards are all about in the sense mm -hmm. that, um, in so many ways, it's all about reprogramming. You're not, uh, to put something on your vision board, the universe doesn't need a wish list, is one thing that I know. Um, but you can kind of categorize aspects of your life that you want to see something different. If I were to put, I don't know, uh, just a studio apartment for myself without a roommate, that could be the equivalence of someone else putting a mansion on the Hollywood Hills on their vision board. Two drastically different things as far as, you know, what one might believe to be their reach. But at the same time, the diff the this thing that is the commonality is that the person who has the mansion on the board and myself are subconsciously programming the brain that it's not as far out of reach as we're telling ourselves it is. You might be saying to yourself, you might be talking yourself out of the, the dog, saying to yourself, I want a dog. Like here, I know I want a dog. I want to have a puppy that I come home to, that I train, that I take for walks and take stupid Instagram photos with. They don't have to be stupid. But you're also having this up here giving you every single reason no. Mm -hmm. Dogs cost money. What are you going to do about your social life? You're going to have to be home taking care of this thing all the time. What about your career? You're working on set today. That dog would be at home. You know, you can't bring it to set. It's not trained. Like a million things there. But then you could also have presumably a vision board with the dog on it. And you're all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but like gradually, if you're doing the work, like you said, you're finding yourself realizing it's not as far of a reach. Okay, yeah, I'm on set, but I can train it or I could get it house set. I'm finding solutions. I'm, I'm finding ways to, to give in to what my heart wants instead of constantly rationalizing why I can't. So like, I'm not going to pretend to know, but when it came to you, I would say are a manifester. In the sense, at least in the little that I've gotten to know you, you've been out here for not even three years. We've, Try not to be insulted over. I'm just kidding. No, we've I'm we've, just we've kidding. been through a pandemic, <laughs> but I mean, we had coffee about a month ago or so, and I I think I made this point. But like, you're on set, you're doing your script supervisor work, you're still writing, you're producing things. Like, you moved out here to do a thing that. I, I feel like it's relatively common knowledge for most people now that isn't something that people can come out here and just do. A lot of people come out here and say they're going to, but you're doing it and you're making it work and you're collaborating. You, you, you said, I want to make a podcast. We're doing a podcast. Do you know how long I've been telling people that I want to do a podcast? No. A lot longer than you've had this one. So like, I don't know if these are goals. I want to make a feature film. I want to produce a feature film. I want to be on a lot of other people's sets and get those experiences, make those connections. I want to do a podcast. Did you have the brain capacity to tell you all the reasons why those shouldn't be things that you focus your energy on? Or were you always just like, these are what I want to do, and your brain immediately just said, great, let's figure it out. Yeah, I'm more of a let's figure it out. Okay. Yeah, no, when when I uh I mean it does take a lot of uh brain work and um to get to the point of making the the final decision. So I'm sure I mean uh, 
I try to not live too long in that the excuses world. Like I know with making my first feature, it's what's on the inside available now on Amazon Prime Video. Amazon Prime Video. Um, that one I had avoided making a feature for the five years of Reno. Like I, I purposefully laid, lived in short films because of X and Y and Z reasons, which are easy to explain in terms of like. Short films are easy because you can make one in like a day or half a day or a weekend. And getting people for that short a time is more doable than an extended stay of a commitment of a feature film. It's more, it's more time, it's more energy. Sure. And, uh, and I didn't feel that that was um, a possibility in Reno at the time. So I saved it for the, the leveling up of Los Angeles. So... Um, but once I got there, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Once the decision is made, then you start finding solutions. Like you said, is how, okay, now that it's been decided now let's, let's, let's make it happen. So, but I don't, I, it's it, I in don't that know. vein, because yeah. like, I, I, I like what you're saying and I get where you're coming from in the sense of you have a goal, you're committing action to said goal and you're achieving it. The, I mean, from what I gather, if the people that are focusing on manifesting certain things, I mean, for me, a lot of it, again, is reprogramming my brain to accept that I can be loud, that I can ask for more than just the burger as is, specificity, as it were. But in the sense of what are some things that you would say are, in your mind, at the moment, out of reach that you want but you almost feel like it's not realistic, not feasible, not... Uh, I mean, th I think a lot of it also comes down to a sense of self-worth. Like, obviously, you're worthy of whatever you choose. But at the same time, depending on your upbringing, again, nature, nurture, you may have conditioned yourself to temper that yeah. desire. You may have conditioned yourself to limit your sense of self-worth. Like, is th what it, what is the next thing you feel like you have to reach for that maybe you don't have to reach as hard as your 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 brain is making it out to be what is the next thing i have to reach for like what is a goal that, that you have in, what that, is what is your next big goal that you well, feel like is a little like, further down like, the road yeah like one thing that i know i'm working toward currently like uh like um so there's yeah we one feature that I've directed is currently out. There are two features I've directed that are in post. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm thinking about... Uh, it's normally like an external validation, kind of external approval goal, which is completely, mostly a lot of... That's where the control... You start, it's not really about you anymore. It's sure. more of like, okay... So I have I have some story ideas that would require collaboration with larger companies. Let's say like developing um, like I would love to develop a a movie based off like a a game board property. Okay. But I can't make that movie without the collaboration and consent of that company. Sure. So for me to even get let's just say in my brain and for me to be considered confidently to be trusted with such a property and to take such a thing it's like well i probably need some additional support on the external validation side is what other producers can back me up to say that this guy can do it what actors what i have worked with that would impress such a person that's talking to me in that vein and that's kind of like a weird thing too or uh being trusted with like this guy has produced stuff in a similar capacity that shows that level leveling up isn't that much of a risk like mitigating the risk factor of, sure of like i've directed stuff in the sub hundred thousand dollar range so why would people trust me with you know a 15 million dollar budget when i haven't shown that i could operate in that capacity so this has all been part of the long game. Correct. So, I mean, when you go to Amazon Prime and watch It's What's on the Inside, notice the subtle hints of game board property 
uh, pitch is. <laughs> there's, there's, they're in there. They're, they're well, I mean that, Easter eggs, but it, <laughs> well, that's more of just you know, the experience gaining. That's more of a, just getting the reps in, sure. in the in the in the craft in general, developing the craft, developing the confidence, and directing actors, and 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 composition framings, and all that. So let me ask you this one. Yeah. What would you say to those people, or or what are your thoughts on those people who take a big swing, and just like, I don't know, I I hear. I don't have any, a specific example, but I've definitely heard stories of like someone saying, oh, you know, I was on a, a flight back from wherever and person in the seat next to me just happened to be a CEO for a game board company. And I always thought it'd be funny to make a, a movie about that game board. And so I, I just pitched it to him on the airplane and now I'm a producer. Like, yeah. Do you, do you feel do you feel like you just want to have the opportunity to just pitch it? Or do you feel like you still have to do X number of reps more, be it short film repetitions or, or um, networking opportunities before you really feel like you can knock on their door and say something? Um, yeah, those, those stories definitely feel like outliers, right? Yeah, those are, those are yeah. total outliers. So my, my, I guess taking from experience again, I script supervise a lot. Yes. Um, so I get to be on set observing other directors in situations similar, not like not too dissimilar from that, where it's this person's feature film debut and they're working with like, you know, millions of dollars here or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they spent a lot of time in pre-production prepping the thing. So sure. this has been like three years in the making and now they're finally on set doing the thing. Yeah. And um, I have watched many a uh, director kind of crumble under the pressure of, it's like, well, all the homework, all the work and reps in the last three years were all producer reps. So it was sure. like just getting the thing made. And so the reps on set there was kind of like some gaps on communication there were gaps on just sustainability of keeping the keeping the energy up for an extended period of time sure um so i'm taking lessons learned from how those have gone wrong where it's like there could be just being through it before in other capacities does give confidence to where you get the big you get the big opportunity you're actually ready for it yes so i know that's that's important to me is like i don't want to show up and be learning on that job like i want to i mean you always will but certainly not yeah. those specific lessons correct uh just curious but out of all these sets that you've been on would you say that there is any one thing that you've witnessed a director do that you're thinking i want to put that into my repertoire i want that in my my briefcase of of things that happen on my sets or how i interact with Cast or crew. Yeah. Yeah. I hearken back to, um, I know I modeled uh, a feature I directed directed and produced last year based off this experience, which in uh, 2019, my first full year in LA, I landed as a script supervisor for a, a nice, a nice indie that was shooting out in Ojai, California. Okay. Um, that one, they were okay. Here's what I loved about them: it was a it was a duo directing team. They're sisters, the McPherson sisters. I've heard of them. Friends of the show. Um, they uh were. I like the. I don't know if I call it humility, but they were aware of potential lacks of experience and what. It, one was more story based and understood the writing a little bit more one was more experienced in the in the like the, the directing of actors coming from theater so they leveraged each other on their own you know pluses to kind of get through the process and they really leaned on their team like they had we had full on conversations with yeah we would meet up kind of before each scene and the script supervisor the director of photography the two directors the ad we'd all just sit around go through all the shots together they would ask questions we'd give suggestions mm -hmm. so it was a very collaborative 
thing and that show ran so smooth like it was like a wonderful beautiful experience we're living on location together yeah so we'd wrap come home to the different cabins they had rented out for us and stuff and we'd have pizza nights together and we'd have dinner together and i know like having that that camaraderie and the the tone they set and how much they appreciated our insights and because they were like, yeah, we need as much help as we can get, and we we brought you on for a reason. So sure. let's uh, let's lean on you versus um, pretend like we know what we're doing and uh, fall apart. Um, so I know I took a lot from them on just I loved how they ran it, and I love being included and all that stuff. So as a director, I know I pulled that from them. I'm like involving everybody as much as possible is the way to go. And uh, I know on my New Mexico feature, I kind of tried to plant some of that own that stuff too, where I wanted people to have a similar experience being on location that I had on the one that I did. That's to answer your question. How do you think it went? Translating their approach to your film. It was wonderful. That's great. It was beautiful. It's awesome. Loved it. Yeah. No. I'm. It was. So yeah, the best set experiences I've had. Um, most definitely were, yeah, and it, yeah, times cherished. Most, yeah. I'm gonna cry. No, yes. I'm sure we'll have updates on when that film can be viewed sooner than later. Yeah, we're looking to lock that in the edit here any day now. Awesome is the is the plan with that one. Today's March third or second, March second. Yes, March, March second. Second. So if you're uh, avid listener to the podcast you can bug yeah, him about this in a couple weeks the plan with that one is to push for the festivals and such awesome. like being that i've never done that before and hopefully the festivals start to become in person more again ideally yeah because i mean south by is starting i don't know is south by in person this year are they doing well, i could be wrong but i believe i i had heard that they were planning their programming to not be hmm I know Sundance was was switched to virtual Maybe last that's minute too. that's what I was too. confused with. Yeah, I might be mixing them up. But either way, we'll be submitting to fests this this summer and this fall and whatnot. And uh, yeah, we'll try for the big boys. We'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Next question. Okay. Another broad one, but this has kind of come up a little bit on. Uh, uh, I don't know how you're going to answer this, but it's it's very basic. <laughs> okay. Um, what is a good story to you? So like wow. like like when you say as an actor you're here trying to help tell a good story. Like yes. you want to be a part of good stories and help tell a good story. What what is More, what is a good story? I would also and this is really just digging the hole deeper, but uh <laughs> good story told well <laughs> i mean there's okay, there's sure. plenty of good stories that get told very not well okay that sentence being a great example <laughs> well i guess that's that's the tricky part about filmmaking sure is all, all you have when you sign on to the project is the good story is is the story yes well depending when you are you saying sign on not even just when you're auditioning because like sometimes from the actor's perspective, all we get is sure. a couple of pages, and we have to be like, I, I. Well, let's just say on the ideal situations in which uh, the a director hits you up out of the blue, and here's like, a script. I have a grand vision. Sure. I have a story, yeah. and I would love to consider you for the thing. Here it is. Check it out. Yes. Would you love to be involved in this? You read the story, and you're trying to figure out: Is this a good story? Do I want to be a part of this? Sure. How it's told comes later because that's the whole collaborative process. And yeah, it depends on. Part. I mean, if someone stays true to the script, it could be told very well. Uh, if the script is already told well. Yeah. Ideally, and I mean, this is this is the reason, at least for me as an actor, and I get the impression for you also as a as a creative and an artist. The collaborative nature of this industry is the huge draw, like respectfully i i sketch i write um i i occasionally paint but the the thing that keeps me coming back to this craft versus any of the others is the idea that i get to collaborate with other people and there are times where you can see 
that not everybody set out to tell the same story when you get to the end of it. Um, I don't know if this is going to resonate or, or click with everyone listening, but a lot of people would say that the stage is the actor's medium. That's where the actor lights up, gets on, the show's happening, it's in real time. What you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you can love, hate it, whatever have you. Film, I I, I was just listening to your your podcast uh, before coming here, and I remember hearing you say that television is the writer's component. I mean, there's very little editing that you can do in post based on the pages that got shot because the pages are king in that instance. And film would be argumentatively the director and the editor's medium. Mm -hmm. So like for me, that's what has made as an actor being able to watch myself on camera. I know a lot of people hate it. I am relatively indifferent for the most part. I don't love it, but I can do it now because I I'm able to take my brain out and first and foremost, just try to connect with the story that we were telling if I'm watching something that I'm in. But then beyond that point, I'm able to accept that, or maybe I'm just trying to give myself a little wiggle room and say like, "Eh, there's probably a better take they didn't use. Sure. And also justifying that to say, you're not who this scene is about. The scene's about your scene partner. So they're definitely going to get that person's best footage. And you might have had a better take if this had been your scene, but the take they used is the one that better tells the story for that person. So I get what you're saying in the sense of the idea that that story told... You're asking what gravitates me or what do I call that story? Well, I guess... Well, I was... I was uh, at the top, just asking about what makes the what separates kind of like a good story from a bad story. I but. I think it's um, it's the journey. It's the journey, both literally, but obviously more importantly, figuratively, the character's journey. Um, generally speaking, especially in traditional narrative, there's at least one main character, or an ensemble, and as tends to be the case with story in general, you start with things one way and you end things in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, Comedy, so on and so forth, generally you end in a higher note. Heavy drama or something, you'll end in a lower note. Things are worse. Like, I don't know, uh, Requiem for a Dream comes to mind. I remember I was in high school and I had a friend who uh, was in his experimental drug phase and mm-hmm. he's like, you got to watch this. I was like, I, okay, sure. And we get done watching. He's like, that's what it's like, man, when you're like... I said, you realize this whole film is a PSA for drug abuse, right? Like, this isn't go do drugs. It was just funny to me. Um, so I, I, I just think that the story component is taking people for a journey and, and ideally in my mind, entertain them in the process. Yeah. Cause there's definitely some stories out there that are told very well that I don't find especially entertaining. Yes. Okay. Broad question, broad answer. That's all I, got. I don't <laughs> know what great. to tell you. No, it's great. It's tough. It's tough. It is. And, but also, Again, the same thing with the awards. It's it's subjective. There are people that are going to love a story that maybe you don't resonate with. There are people who hate superhero films. There are clearly people who love them. Hence the box office. Money. Yeah. I'm excited for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I'll tell you that. I am as well. Um <laughs> As much as I've enjoyed the MCU overall, it's Doctor Strange that I came out of the theater th- from the first one and said to myself, I think I want to read some of these, mm. you know? Have you been dabbling since? Uh, not specifically, no. Okay. I, I'm still more of a DC Comics reader, but um, yeah, do- I mean, Doctor Strange, sorry, nerd history, please, but please. 
Doctor Strange was created by Steve Ditko, who was also a co-collaborator in creating Spider-Man and uh, a couple of different DC and Charlton Comics characters. So it's kind of interesting to me that that would be uh, a character that would resonate with me out of the MCU. And a lot of his artwork is mm -hmm. also translated into the original Doctor Strange film. Yeah. So they're cool about that kind of stuff. Very trippy. Dig it. Whew. Okay, this has been good so far. I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna boy. wind us down with uh, the final topic of the day. What is love? Uh, <laughs> no. Don't hurt me. No. Okay. But the uh, to answer a question you asked off camera earlier, I did play football. Okay. For one year in high school. Humble brag. For one year. Went out on top. Just called it there, right? I I clocked in two interceptions that season. Hey. Off the bench. You, you got it's horrible. Oh, it's horrible times. I hated it. But you kept the helmet. No, that's a that's a Carolina Panthers helmet. I can't see it well from here. I just that's that's just that's just fan memorabilia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, I I can see it just enough to say football and not be like, oh, you ride a motorcycle? That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Neat. I also rode a motorcycle. I had a sport bike for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it was lovely. So the final topic of the day. Okay is um kind of why we're here in the first place it's 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 uh podcasting podcasting how how a podcast is made yes why 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 podcast um also you also asked about how i find my guests um yes i did for the people who don't know this this whole interview kind of was initiated by me asking him for advice on how to start a podcast so this so, was this is probably, he's probably not recording any of this. And <laughs> this is just him being like, and that's how it's done. And that's how it's done. Uh, if you like, if you like the guest that comes, it puts out, I don't know if I remember. Eddie, when's that episode coming out? <laughs> oh, you know, there was just some bad sound. That's dump truck. Yeah. So I don't know. Okay. What, um, when you, when you, you, so you've been thinking about starting a podcast for a while, as you had said earlier. Yes. Uh, what is your question as to how do you answer the why question? What, what, why, why, what excites you about doing a, doing a podcast? Okay. Um, and why? <laughs> and, and why? Um, I, I, when, when you pitch this podcast to people, what, how do you, how, how do you pitch you? it? How dare you? How do you pitch it? It's easy. My podcast is very simple. This podcast is for me. Okay. Just like anything else I do. Yeah, yeah. The movies I make are movies, like you said, there was like movies that I would want to watch. Yes. Um, because that's the only way I feel I could survive the the work is like as long as I like it, I'm happy, and everything sure. else is gravy. So this was um. Uh, the I don't know how do i pitch it the initial conception what i tell people a lot of people ask is what is your podcast about okay that's a classic question it's like i do a podcast what's it about i was like what do you mean does it have to be about something i'm confused because i know a lot of podcasts are like crime crime podcasts or they, <sighs> that's they, what we didn't cover they, crime. Ta they talk about sports food. or we they, got we got football with the sports they talk about the stock market we got food or it's about screenwriting and things that are interesting to screenwriters sure this is... Ooh, I've, I've probably just completely offended with my <laughs> obliteration of what story is or isn't. Yeah, exactly. Um, most likely. Well, so this uh, is a show in which I sit down with a person and talk for two to three hours. And because of my background, um, I want it to be interesting for me. I normally dabble in talking film, film-related stuff. I want to talk about uh, different aspects of the process that I'm less familiar with. Like I want to, I want to get more uh, insight into the shoes of the people around me on set. So that's kind of like my goal, but I also, it's vague. Like I can sit with down with somebody for, It definitely you know, leaves some wiggle room. Yeah. Yeah. I can talk with anybody. The whole point is, am I interested to have this conversation? And uh, is there something I can learn from it? And that's, and then ideally, the conversation's engaging, and others could also uh, by the partake. end of it, everyone's like, "Why, why isn't there? Listening? Why isn't there a movie about a board game that this guy has made?" 
yeah, yeah. That this guy's acting in. Why is that not? Why is that not? Why are they not collaborating to make the uh, the game the game movie? They should have just worn a big red nose, and and just laid out flat. That it's is not Operation. Um, okay. Not okay. Yeah. So uh, that's that's my thing. My to peel the layer back a little bit more. I I initially did it because um, it was deep twenty twenty quarantine life. And I just, and I just wanted to talk Recall. to people. Yeah, I wanted to talk to people, and I wanted to talk to people for an extended period of time. I'm not satisfied with a 15 minute, 30 minute. There's nothing. There's not. Really, you can't really get past the surface level with that sure. amount of time. It's hard. So, uh, and also in the very beginning, like I just wanted to get better at conversation too. Like I wanted to be more confident talking for an extended period of time and here we are yeah <sighs> so it was for me i want to get better at stuff and i want an excuse to talk to people and have human interaction because uh we have to have excuses for that these days yes we do well again uh i'm just going to emphasize the inspiration because there you go you you i i won't abuse the word manifest but you set a goal and you made it happen you figured something you wanted and you found solutions to make it work that you've been kind enough to share with me the insights of what some of the technology is and some of the approaches mm -hmm. where I, you know, probably have been thinking about my idea for maybe a couple of years now and couldn't be bothered to do a Google search. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I'll, and I'll show more on the post site too with uh, um, what what I do with the files and, and yeah. how I put all that together because it's a little it's a little involved on the back end too. It's this is work, people. <laughs> Look, if I if I if this is a three hour chunk of time, and then I have to edit it and I have to rewatch it a certain extent to do all the you know it's it's sure. like it's like half a it's like a half a day half a day of work. Wow. Um, which you know, it's lovely. But I mean, you've got Milton Bradley sponsoring the podcast, so that's that's good. Baskin Robbins as well. Sure, they know I love ice cream. Also, here's your complimentary Eddie. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's Eddie flavored. <laughs> nice. Okay, so when it comes down to you and why, and what excites you about doing it, like how when so how how are you preparing for the um the what's it about thing? Like how have you thought? I'm sure yes, you, I'm sure you've thought. Uh, absolutely. Um, so I I have two podcast ideas, but I'm. I'll just gloss over the the one that I think would take a little bit more preparation, which would be uh, a con. Maybe it probably already exists. Who knows? But uh, most, most likely, I want to have a historian and somebody who either is incredibly knowledgeable or has worked in directly with the comic book industry uh, or is fluent in comic book history. And I want to be able to talk about the correlation of life imitating art and art influencing or inspiring things in life. Um, there's a lot of overlap that I, I personally don't even know about, but I'm like aware of, mm -hmm. and I feel like it would be a very interesting topic for a lot of other people. Uh, a super throwaway example is, uh, a cover of Captain America showed him l punching Hitler, uh, well before we ever got into the war. And that was to do with the writers and artists predominantly being of Jewish descent and really feeling a drive to do that. And this, yeah. you know, pseudo propaganda became a, a big component of, I'm not going to say that it in influenced legislation or anything, but like, uh, you know, it's part of the zeitgeist. And uh, there are plenty of other examples of things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, I was, I was going to say, um, rule of thumb for sure. Like you said, you think it might be interesting for other people. I th well, it's very interesting to me. Yes. Which is which I think you mentioned that. Yeah, I'm assuming it's interesting. So, yeah. I was going to say that at the end of the day, as long as it's interesting to you, it's kind of like you one could assume it's because that's that's the, that's the thing that's frustrating with the film industry, let's say, with with what we hear about the processes of how bigger budget movies get made. Is, sure. It's like we gotta hit a we gotta hit our four quadrants on this thing. Like yeah. everybody's gotta like yeah. it, and then so you start injecting all this stuff. Is how are we gonna get the moms? How are we gonna get the dads? How are we gonna get the 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 teen the teen boys? Yeah. So you start 
trying to appeal to everybody. And then at the end of the day, you appeal to nobody. Very, very true. So the, um, the almost the more the more specific appeal becomes yes is, is almost this is the way to go so it's, which comes down yeah i was so, going to say the niche is, is is the best the main one the one that i i'm here um hopefully going to be able to take this information and and go running with is um forgive the pitch component here how many times have you had someone say to you either verbatim or the equivalence of um, in regards to what you're pursuing, what you're passionate about? That's so great. I can't wait to tell people I knew you when. It's like it, it's an old fashioned phrase, right? It kind of hurts. Right. I can't wait to tell people I knew you when. It's well, kinda, it's kind of nice. I mean, I, it's, it's it's intended it's, with kindness. Yeah, it could be it could be nice. It can also be annoying. Either the response. Way. I mean, I'm not pretending that it's happened to me a ton or all the time or anything like that. Every, but every day, the response that I I give when I hear something like that now is that's very kind of you. Do me a favor and tell them you know me now. So right now we're living in a time where. Everyone has their cameras pointed at themselves and they're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And uh, I <laughs> here we are. Here we are. I, I feel fortunate that I've met a lot of really interesting people in all different aspects of life. And some of them could benefit from basic exposure. And I'd like to try to create a platform where I can say, I know this person. Let me introduce you, whoever's listening, to this person. Mm -hmm. And maybe you want to know them better too. Because a example being, I have, I have a friend in particular who's a, a very talented fine artist. Not all of their work resonates with me. I might not be their audience. They could very well be doing much better, be it financially or, or exposure-wise, if all I did was tell more people, hey, I know this artist. And all I got to do is show you their artwork. Mm -hmm. And you might be like, this is amazing. I love this. Oh, I'm so glad you showed this to me. All I had to do was show it to you. Yeah. But instead, uh, I, I have a friend. And I don't talk about it. That's why I like the name dropping thing. And it's like, you never yeah. know what's going to resonate with somebody else. I We're was, all connected. Yeah. I was going to add slash spin the thing you just said. Okay. Because you, you, it was the I knew you when mantra. Um, it's not a mantra. The, I mean, uh, the podcast would ideally be called I know them now or hashtag I know yeah. them now. So I was thinking about the, the thing that I probably hear or I've heard more commonly is the don't forget me when. Oh, it's like remember me when you're famous, or don't for, don't forget about me when you're famous. And I know I've seen. I um, can see where that one would rub you the wrong way, because <laughs> they mean it in a in a heartfelt way too. Is like you're going places, don't don't lose me along the way. Yeah, but I had I guess what I was gonna go with that is, I have seen on probably like Instagram and Facebook people different artists sharing the. It's like I don't know if it's like a meme template or what, but it's like. Don't remember me when it's like, how about you kind of the now thing? Why, how about you want, watch my, watch my content, comment, sure. like yeah. engage with me along this journey. So that way I don't forget you. Like you, you can support me and that'll keep you in yes. support me along my entire journey. And I won't forget you versus just saying that. Yeah. It's not gonna... I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that I, even remotely have my head wrapped around the semantics of social media, be it Instagram, TikTok, or whatever these days. But I know that at least in my experience, I've gotten to the point where I get really frustrated because I do follow friends and acquaintances and I want to be supportive. And these are my hangups. This has sure this is not on them whatsoever. But you know, I I write something in their comments to be supportive and don't even realize it until afterwards, but like I'm a drop in the bucket. They're getting messages from 400, 5,000, depending plus people. And there's, again, my hang up is the frustration that 
I want to be a supportive friend, which is the people that I want to bring on to my podcast. And it's hard to feel like that connection is there if I feel like I'm also in the waiting pool with fans. You should follow me. I, you, I mean, I want to support you as a friend. I need to be a follower mm-hmm. to support mm-hmm. you. Do you, do you know these 500 other people? No, but I'm in the same boat with them. Like those distinctions kind of weigh yeah. on me a little bit. Yeah. I'm sure I'm overthinking it. Well, there are, I guess, I guess the way I think about it is, um, let's say you star in an, in an upcoming feature film. Okay. Let's say that. Let's just say, let's just say that. Sure. And then at no point, like you kind of post about it on your Instagram, like, "Hey guys, my movie just dropped on on uh, on Amazon Prime Video, or whatever." Like it was, and you post about how awesome it was, and and then just, and then I go and I and I and I subtly go and watch it and support and and like I just want to check out what this is. He's really excited about it, and I watch it, and then I uh, I'll go leave a comment. Do I watch the movie? And I might be one of like you know three hundred comments in there. Sure. Because everybody's stoked about the people are saying congrats, you know all the I get lost in the congrats you know thing. But then I have your number too, and I could send the direct text. I sure. could, yeah. I guess it always depends on the the personal connection that you already have. Absolutely. But I know the 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 watching the stuff without being asked to watch it always means a lot. Um, and yes. then, and then letting, letting them know that I, I actually checked out your thing and you were awesome in it. And how, so, how wound down are we? Cause now I have like two questions, but I don't want to no, it's, railroad it's us. Go for it. So my initial one, cause I, I love that example. Um, I recently had somebody connect with me out of nowhere on Instagram, uh, asking if I was, this one character in this industrial, the industrial that I went back and filmed in Maryland. Okay. Weirdly enough, they they recognized me, and I I don't remember. Oh, they watched a uh, independent feature I, I worked on that shot in Washington State a couple years ago, called Ape Canyon, also on Amazon Prime. They produce or they they distribute a bunch of stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure my name's spelt wrong, so you might not be able to find it if you look me up on there. Oh well. Okay. Uh. But it was, I'd never met this person. I have no idea who they are. Uh, but they said some very kind words about this film or uh, about me. Well, the film and also this industrial, which is like so funny when people actually reach out to you about industrials because yeah, most of them weird. are very in house. They're not shown to a lot of people. Um, and it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me to think that a stranger who has no reason to reach out at all if they don't want to, like they had to take the extra effort. If you, I mean, I don't know what the response has been specifically with uh, It's What's on the Inside on Amazon Prime, but when you get positive responses from people you've never met, do you feel do you feel like there's a notable scale difference between positive responses from people you know personally? Like the idea of, oh, I, I obviously friends, close friends and family, you want to like it and you you want to believe that there's sincerity and they're, they're kind mm-hmm. words, mm-hmm. but also like people that, you know, and you, they come back at you and they're like, Hey man, I know we haven't talked in a while, but I watched your movie. It was really good. I really enjoyed it. And they cover a few things they liked in particular. Do you feel a sense like your heart grows X number bigger that day on their kind words over a stranger's or the other way around? Or is there a difference? I know, I will say, my mind goes to, um, I'll, I'll answer this in a, in a, in a layered. A riddle? So. <laughs> a limerick? <laughs> so, people that, there's people that reach out and give compliments that you can tell and have never watched a thing. <laughs> sure. They're I called ha- bots. <laughs> it's called, they're called actors. Oh. <laughs> It happens on occasion. We're like, oh, I, 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 oh my gosh! Like, what are you? Are you casting for anything? I, like, I'm like that happens to me on Instagram. I mean, I frequently enough. Well, I've certainly not just asked if someone's casting anything outright, but I've definitely referenced a film that I've watched of theirs. That's helpful. Sure. 
yeah, I, th I would say if you're going to reach out and ask about stuff, at least let me know that you've watched things that I've done and that you like what I do sure. versus seeing I'm a director. And then either way, so there's that aspect. Um, if you watch stuff and you reach out and you compliment the thing I, and you're a stranger, I know it means, um, no, it's lovely. I, I usually look at it as like, this is, uh, I know it means more when there are when it's people that have stuck with me since like the beginning or something. I know that yeah that because I'm like you've watched so much of my stuff and I know a lot of it is not very good, um or like it was in in the moment. I mean I'm having fun and I'm, I'm making stuff and I'm putting it out in the world and there's no obligation that you have to watch everything I ever do because it's a lot of you know kind of learning on the fly and sure. experimenting and. Stuff doesn't always land. So when you watch stuff like that, I'm like, oh, thanks for sitting through that. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, I, I guess I mean to say is people that know you personally. Yeah. I mean, of course, it, it means the world that they are supportive of you. But do you feel a sense of like for I, I'm just projecting here, but the fact that this person, the stranger reached out and said, I, I saw you in two different things. I recognize you and I like your work. Mm hmm. That is the closest thing outright where I could say to myself, oh, I I have an audience sure. that like connects with my work. That is that doesn't have a, a metaphorical gun to their head to be like, you know me. Yeah. Watch my stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I don't know. For me, it, it, I I I guess to answer your question, I feel more when it's somebody that I know. Okay. Like when when it's on the inside finally came out, I had been pursuing film for about you know like eight years, and when people from the early days were like, "Yeah, I rented your movie," I'm like, "What? That's so cool! Thank you so much!" Yeah. Like that that means uh, that means a lot. That some people that you almost forgot about sure or that Reconnect you that, that, that you that you don't yeah. keep in touch with as much as, as you once did and you're like oh you supported me by watching the movie like and you you didn't you totally didn't have to do that like that means a lot um though stranger stuff is nice too yeah yeah no it's it's yeah i mean i i don't i i don't have especially a lot of experience with the stranger stuff but it it, it does kind of throw you for a second mm-hmm you know, it's lovely. Yeah, all compliments are welcome. All compliments. Ah, what was the no criticisms question? though? So. No, no, I mean, constructive, but also like really soft constructive. The answer is, I already thought about that, and uh, thank sure. you for reminding me that I thought that at one point too. Yeah, I moved on. <laughs> but but also, especially with this particular episode, if you do leave a comment, please make sure or a question, make sure that you write begs the question, so just that, to so just to push the, the button. So that begs the question. What was your second question? I'm I'm trying to recall. I I was very uh, captured by your answer, <laughs> but you did mispronounce your your film title, which is a little embarrassing. It's what's on the inside. Uh, it's pronounced. It's what's on the inside on Amazon Prime. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Lovely. It's okay. All right. So I guess the last bit was how I choose my guests. You were kind of asking off camera, but I can answer here. I mean, I kind of answered it already. It's like they ask how to podcast and you feel obliged is, is, to uh, record the explanation is do I want to sit with this yes. person for two to three hours and engage? Yeah. Um, that's not that. I mean, that's, you know, there's multiple boxes. Box number one is, can I sit with this person and talk with them? And if, if you don't want to sit with that, don't like, don't, I haven't, I haven't quite done that where I have been reached out to with like, Hey, can I be on your podcast? And I'm like, I don't want to talk with you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Or I don't, or I know like closer friends, like I kind of want to get everybody on at some point, but sometimes I meet up with people too often. I'm like, we're not going to have anything to talk about. Right. Like, yeah, that I already sense. see you. I see you all the time. We're sure. not going to, what are we going to do here? Um, so that's, um, so I do, almost feel bad for some people that I see more often. I'm like, I'll get you on at some point. Would not, you ever want to take wanna... this live? Sure. I don't, that sounds, I sure, know. Like not? I just, I, I, the same there thing. are some podcasts that I listen to that are live uh, or that will do live interviews situations. And it's always interesting to me. I know I crumble under 
some I can crumble under pressure for sure. Okay. Uh, like I know if a guest, if I'm if I've been trying to get a guest on for a while, like the effort to get them in the room. Yeah. And then I'm like so afraid of like wasting time and all that kind of stuff can come up and I'm like, oh no. Like I just flub everything and my brain doesn't work. So if it can be chill and I can just remind myself we're just two people are just chilling and sitting. Yep. And we're cool and, and uh it's you gotta you know, but sometimes it's um it can get scary. So live I feel like Maybe it'd be chill. I don't know. It's one of those things I just gotta just gotta do it. But yeah. I suppose it depends on the venue, depends on the guest. What I wanna do is I wanna get multiple cameras at one point. You I crazy wanna, son of a gun. I wanna have one camera close up you and one camera close up me and then us chat and then the and edit. We'll have can the go GoPros back. on our heads the so edit, this way we can the edit can go back and forth. I think that would help with yeah. um video audience retention. <laughs> It's nice to have the cuts, and so we can focus on you and see see that emotion in your face a little bit better. You know, we want that, right, people? I want it, so I can watch them later. These are all archives for future Eddie to just reflect on his life. Sure. That's kind of what this is about. It's like, look at that guy; he was going for it, and now look at you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Board game mogul. I know, right? All right. I think we're good. Okay. That was lovely. Uh, last, 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 last question. For people that want to follow the journey of Clayton Stalker Myers, where where do you recommend they uh, keep, keep in the loop? Um, the main three sources would be my actual website, which is my whole name, Clayton Stalker, S-T-O-C-K-E-R, Myers, M-Y-E-R-S dot com. Uh, IMDB, if you ever feel like taking a look or a, a gander down the resume. And uh, Instagram, very simple, is at actor CSM. Initials, your initials. Yeah. Give a shout. Let me let me know what you're up to. I don't know. Meet new, meet new people. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Great. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, do the things. Like, subscribe rate leave a review um just for my uh, bye everybody bye <laughs>